Let's talk a little bit about what we can do as individuals. Tell me more about that. I think as individuals, uh, a lot of what we do is determined by what we're enabled to do. So uh, choosing where we live, I think, is one of the biggest factors that individuals can control in their lives. If you choose to live a 45-minute drive away from where you work, um, you're automatically putting an hour and a half drive into your day. There's uh, emissions associated, associated with that. There's also stress of being in the car. And the health impact of, being, um, of not being active for that time as well. Um, that's a very complicated question, though. So if I want to live where I work, how much is the house there versus in the suburbs? But it might be balanced off against transportation costs. If I move closer, if the home is more expensive, my transportation costs might be lower. So I guess you're saying that we should consider these things and, and calculate. Yeah, you know, particularly if the cost of gas is going up, filling up your car every week might be going up, uh, the insurance that you're paying on your vehicle, the maintenance that you're paying on your vehicle. My family, we've chosen to have one vehicle. I, I take the bus, I ride my bike, and I take taxis. Well, taxis are very inexpensive compared to insuring a second car. Maybe I can consider buying a hybrid as my next car and consuming half the gasoline. Yeah, uh, again, there's a calculation that has to be done. Hybrids are a lot more expensive, so what's the payback on, on the hybrid? The thing that I find fascinating about this line of, of questions is we don't know a lot of the time. It's, it's, a complicated, it's a complicated issue that I, I think we need to make choices as individuals. You know, I'm not here to judge anybody. People have to make the best choices for their family. But the, the process is about asking the questions. So what's the best way of doing this? What's the most cost-effective way of doing this? And sitting down and, and you know, figuring out, out how much per month you're going to spend on gas and how long it would take to pay the difference for a hybrid. Right, so a clean environment to me is worth something, but my calculation might be a little bit different than your calculation and you're saying that's fair. Yeah, I think that's very fair. Other things we can do? I think the city is uh, doing a really good job at considering alternatives, like an uh, anti-idling bylaw, for instance. Uh, an anti-idling bylaw would make it illegal for folks to idle their vehicles for any length of time. I, I, I think the way that we're thinking about it, though, is, uh, is a bit problematic. So right now, it's a voluntary mechanism. People are choosing to turn off their cars. In my experience, voluntary mechanisms aren't very uh, effective tools at getting environmental outcomes. So in, in, in terms of thinking about this, where do we want to, where do we want to apply this bylaw? Uh, school zones. I think getting kids involved in this type of discussion uh, is very important. Um, and I think kids are, are a great motivation for parents to change their behavior. I also think that putting something like anti-idling into a job performance for an employee is also a great tool. So there's an incentive. Uh, the person's job review is going to um, depend in part on how they behave environmentally. So, you know, the city of Edmonton owns and operates a lot of vehicles. There's a lot of vehicles that may or may not be idling. Are the people driving those vehicles being judged on that in their performance review? And other employers can do this as well if they see that as being beneficial. The government of Alberta also runs a lot of vehicles. They're, they're big fleets, uh, trucking companies. It's also a uh, cost saving. So if you're not idling a vehicle, uh, you're saving money. And if your fleet is very large, you could be saving a lot of money. Matthew, perhaps some other municipal policy directions that can be put into place. The idea of, uh, it, it, if we're talking about uh, urban form generally, I think having a retrofit built program for buildings. So having uh, an enhanced ret retrofit program so that folks can have part of the costs of improving the efficiency of their homes would be a big step forward. It's a win-win. Uh, it's putting people to work to retrofit the homes. It's allowing the homeowners to have a more efficient home which is cheaper to run and it's uh, lessening the emissions from those area source emissions that, that we mentioned earlier in this conversation. So perhaps encouraging homeowners to get a higher efficiency furnace, better insulation, maybe even geothermal if that makes sense in your situation. Yeah, again, geothermal is one of those questions where you need to do the math to figure out whether it's worth, worth the money to install it. But uh, insulation, furnace, windows, these are all very important things that 
um, uh, folks need help with on a day-to-day -day basis, financially. Anything else? I like the idea of a very targeted vehicle inspection clinic, something that would um, address the issue of the gross emitting vehicles that we have in, in the city of Edmonton in, in Alberta. What's a gross emitting vehicle? Um, the Clean Air Strategic Alliance in, I think it was 2008, did a survey of vehicles in a number of cities in Alberta, including Edmonton. They found that about 5% of the vehicles, the vehicles that are 1996 or older, tend to emit uh, a lot more emissions than newer vehicles. So is that automatic then that a vehicle that is that old or older is a gross emitter or is it because there's something mechanically wrong? A gross emitting vehicle uh, emits five times more emissions than what their uh, specs indicate that they should. It, it just so happens that older vehicles are uh, they have uh, older technology to control the emissions. So new cars are, are by virtue of being newer, cleaner. Uh, old cars are dirtier and old cars that uh, aren't in tune, uh, if they're emitting five times more emissions than the specs for the cars, then they're considered a gross emitter. Some thought should be given into how we can, uh, how we can ensure that the older vehicles on the road are tuned appropriately or, or even replaced. The, uh, the issue with that, though, of course, is it's not a simple answer. A lot of folks who drive older vehicles can't afford a newer vehicle. How do we manage that? How do we help them um, tune their vehicle? Or if they want to replace it, how can we help them replace it? And I guess one final question, Matthew. We've talked about some interesting ideas. How can these interesting ideas be sort of wrapped into the City of Edmonton's environmental strategic plan, the way we green? That's, uh, that's a hard question. I, I, I think... It's not, a, it's not a one answer, it's not a single solution. It's a, a number of different solutions. This is one of them. Uh, having open conversations about the issues that are, are important to Edmontonians, about the issues that are important to uh, folks about the, the greening of the city, uh, the urban form, how folks move through the city. I think it's about having all these conversations with as many different people as possible to get as many different perspectives as possible to help inform the policy making process that we're going through with the environmental strategic plan. Well put. Well, thanks for joining us today, Matthew, and sharing these very useful ideas with respect to ambient air quality. Well, thank you, Marvin. It was uh, my pleasure.